That Tuesday, September 11th, was like any other Tuesday morning. It was only unusual in that the president was going to travel to Florida. We had no idea where it was safe and where it wasn't. Condoleezza Rice, National Security Advisor, responsible for the continuity of government in a crisis. The White House is an obvious target, and Rice is inside it. The president got on the phone and he said, I'm coming back. I said, you cannot come back here. The United States of America is under attack. You have to go to safety. We don't know what is going on here. And he said, I'm coming back. I said, you can't. It's going into Washington. It could be a third aircraft. It could be a third aircraft going on to Washington and headed towards Washington. I said to him in a raised voice, and I had never raised my voice to the president before, I said, you cannot come back here. I hung up. The president was quite annoyed with me, to say the least. As the crisis mounts, communication systems are failing at the heart of government. The number of cell phones that were used to communicate the most sensitive information. If the terrorists were monitoring our communications, uh, they would have heard a lot on cell phones. Card is Bush's right-hand man. The president was trying to track down Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. I was trying to help track him down, too. It wasn't just the president. There were others trying to track him down. Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, tries to organize a military response while his own headquarters is under attack. Rumsfeld has to choose. Head for the command bunker or help the wounded. 300 yards from the explosion, Rumsfeld decides to see the damage for himself. I was told where it was and immediately ran down the hall. Donald Rumsfeld is surveying the crash site, surrounded by injured staff. I got down there very early and there were people helping people out of the building. I tried to reach Don Rumsfeld. He was needed in the uh, command center. And I couldn't. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I looked behind me. There is smoke pouring out the Pentagon. And a plane had hit the Pentagon. It is yet another aircraft that has targeted a um, symbol, the United States power, but there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. Nine forty. The World Trade Center and the Pentagon are already in flames. Where next? Millions look to the skies and the government. With the president in Florida, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice must try and stop the chaos spiraling out of control. When the uh, second plane went in, I knew it was a terrorist attack. When the plane went into the Pentagon, I thought it might be all-out attacks all over Washington, all over the United States. The Secret Service came in and they said, you have got to go to the bunker. I remember just being driven along, almost propelled along. We had no idea um, where it was safe and where it wasn't. We didn't think the bunker of the White House was safe at that point. A hundred feet below ground, Rice joins Vice President Dick Cheney and other senior officials all struggling to understand the scale of the crisis. Norm Manetta, the transportation secretary, was tracking tail numbers of aircraft on a yellow pad. He's calling out, he's saying, what happened to 671? What happened to 123? And he's, he's trying to make sense of what's going on. My first thought was, get a message out to the world that the United States of America has not been decapitated. These pictures must have been terrifying. And that it must have seemed that the United States of America was
coming apart. My test was to keep my head about me and to uh, make certain that people around the world didn't panic. Despite all of the sophisticated command and control, sophisticated equipment that we had, uh, at that moment, much of it didn't function very well. And people instead did whatever they could to communicate messages. And frankly, we then had to make it up. Moments ago has crashed into the Pentagon in Washington, and now they are evacuating the west wing of the White House. 945. Staff have been leaving the White House since 9.20. After the attack on the Pentagon, they're told to run. Within the hour, the UN building in New York and the Sears Tower in Chicago are also deserted, and all of Lower Manhattan is evacuated. But below the White House's east wing, a World War II-era bunker is packed with top officials. There are so many people in the bunker that the oxygen levels started dropping. And the Secret Service came in and said, we've got to get some people out of here. They literally went around telling people that they weren't essential and they had to leave. Condoleezza Rice and Vice President Cheney remain, struggling to maintain some structure in government. Air Force One is still circling over Florida. President Bush is safe, but noticeably absent. To have the president as the one who could comfort the American people and let them know that the world wasn't coming to an end was a real disadvantage to have him out of Washington at that moment. Al-Qaeda's attack on America triggers Cold War protocols. The US military raises its defense readiness condition to DEFCON 3. It's only been higher during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I knew that our forces were going up on alert, our military forces. And I had been schooled and taught about the spiral of alerts. American military forces alert, Russian forces alert, we alert, they alert. And pretty soon, you're at DEFCON 1 and near war just on the basis of alerts. With the president somewhere over Louisiana, Rice decides to pick up the hotline to the Kremlin herself. So I called President Putin and I said, Mr. President, our forces will be going up on alert. He said, I know, we've seen them. Ours are coming down. We've canceled an exercise. You don't have to worry about us. Is there anything else that we can do? And for one moment, I had this moment of reflection, I thought. The Cold War is really over. It's really over. Three planes, three teams of hijackers, three disasters. How many more? Hundreds of aircraft laden with passengers and jet fuel are still in the air. Rumors of more hijackings continue. America's leaders face a terrible dilemma. One, two, three, four. Possibly five. Have you asked the question what you're going to do if uh, we actually find this guy? Are we going to shoot him down? They got passengers on board. Have they talked about that? Only the president can give the order to shoot down a civilian aircraft. It's never been done in U.S. history. Bush is on the line to the White House bunker. The vice president and I were standing side to side, and he was on the phone, and I could hear his side of the conversation. And he was asking the president what he should tell the Pentagon to do if the plane was not responding properly. And uh, I remember mouthing to myself, I don't even know if it was audible to the vice president, we'll have to shoot it down, we'll have to shoot it down. Chief of Staff Andrew Card is with Bush on Air Force One. The president was asked about authorizing a pilot to shoot down a commercial jetliner. And he said, I was an Air National Guard pilot. And I can't imagine getting in a plane and taking off and then being given an order to shoot down a commercial plane. Bush has misgivings, but makes his decision. He got the order from the president and it was passed on to the Pentagon that in fact that would be our action. 
Vice President has cleared. Vice President has cleared us to intercept track. Shoot them down if they do not respond first. Um, the news is that it's been hijacked by terrorists. They are planning to probably use the plane as a target to hit some site on the ground. Try to overpower these guys if you can. Uh, uh, I love you, sweetie. Bye. Ground-to-air messages like these do what the U.S. military can't. They get decisive and timely information into the hands of people who can do something about it. United 93, Cleveland, do you still hear the center? United 93, do you still hear Cleveland? The decision to launch a fight back has prevented another attack on Washington. But when America's leaders hear about the crash, they assume that their air force is responsible. Everyone in that room thinks that perhaps it's been shot down. I got on the phone with somebody at the uh, National Military Command Center, and I can't to this day tell you who it was, uh, just saying, you must know whether or not you've shot down a commercial airliner or not. That was just a horrible thought. United 9 three. Have you got information on that yet? Yeah, he's down. He's down? Yes. As I've reflected now on what the passengers and crew of, of 93, Flight 93 did, first of all, there's a sense of personal gratitude that they may well have saved my life, me, personally. I also think of what they did for the country because uh, I had another plane hit the White House or the Capitol I just don't think we had much more capacity to absorb greater shock than we already had. One floor drops, then the next, triggering a pancake collapse. And all of a sudden somebody said, oh my God. there had been a little bit of hope that you were going to be able to rescue people even if the floors where the plane had gone in you couldn't survive that people could get out but suddenly realizing that a lot of people weren't going to get out that was really really terrible 2,605 people die in and around the World Trade Center including 411 emergency workers. Their comrades scour the site. My calendar for that day, I've since retrieved. And there were lots of things on it. And my secretary, when it happened, just put a large X through it and said, America attacked. 9-11 and that said it all nothing else that we were going to do that day nothing else that we were going to do after that day was ever the same 